If I were to ask you which countries have been the most influential in the last century, many of you would think places like the United States, Germany, or maybe, if you're big fans of luxury goods and sports cars, Italy. However, in this list, there is one country that is not usually remembered, but that undoubtedly deserves a special position. We are talking about Japan. Japan has been one of the places that has most revolutionized global culture in the 20th century. Video games such as Mario Brothers, Zelda, or even Pac-Man. There are also animated TV series such as Pokemon and Dragon Ball. Even if you're not familiar with these shows and games, think of products as essential as the digital camera, the flat screen TV, or the gel pen. All of them came first from Japan. Japan's contribution to global lifestyle and economy has been enormous. The point is that Japanese economic and cultural power has been fierce or at least it was until the arrival of the 21st century. Let's be clear, Japan today is not what it used to be. Yes, the Japanese continue to make great animated series like Attack on Titan, but beyond that, the truth is that Japan has practically disappeared from the map of global economic giants. Since the early 2000s and following a major financial crisis that hit the land of the rising sun hard, the Japanese economy has fallen into lethargy and has lagged far behind other world powers. Of course, this not only affects Japan's position as an economic power, but has also taken a significant toll on the lives of its own citizens. For example, not only do the Japanese have 40% less purchasing power than their US counterparts, but their level of inequality, as measured by the Relative Poverty Index, is the second highest in the entire OECD. Now, having a lot of inequality in a very rich country like the US or Canada is not really such a big problem. But in Japan, where the level of wealth is starting to be more like that of an average country, it is something much more concerning. Be that as it may, many of you might ask here, why did Japan go from being an absolute world leader to completely lagging behind. As we've already mentioned, Japan suffered a major crisis at the end of the 20th century. In that crisis, a huge financial and real estate bubble burst, plunging the country into massive debt, causing high unemployment and punishing the Japanese people with a considerable loss of wealth. For this reason, the 1990s became known in Japan as the lost decade. Even so, the truth is that the Japanese crisis was not the only factor contributing to the country's economic stagnation. In fact, it might not even have been the most important factor. During the 1970s and the 1980s, when Japan was at its peak, the economy sector that boosted its national success was technology. Thanks to its relatively cheap and well-educated labor force, and to being one of the countries in Asia with the best relations with the West, Japan became something like the world's great factory of cheap and cutting-edge technology. At that time, technology giants such as Sony, Nintendo, and Panasonic were among the world's biggest technology companies. Their industry grew to such an extent that Japan managed to stop the US from dominating the microchip sector. However, starting in the 1990s, something Something happened that changed everything. As it turns out, other Asian countries such as Taiwan and South Korea realized that Japan had a large technology market that was making them a lot of money. So what did they do? You guessed it, they copied the Japanese model. Since then, both South Korea and Taiwan, and later China itself, began to compete with the Japanese, and not only that, that they ended up being better and cheaper than the Japanese themselves. Basically, the rest of Asia wrestled the technology monopoly from the land of the rising sun. And following that, along with the financial crisis, Japan took a back seat, living in stagnation and with less and less international relevance. But what if all this were about to change? What if Japan could once again become the technological giant it once was? Check this out. Japan's GDP grew 2.7% in the first quarter on robust spending. The Japanese economy is off to a great start in 2023. And beyond the fact that this may be due to external factors, the truth is that many analysts indicate that Japan could have the opportunity to enter a new phase of enormous economic expansion. In fact, this recent growth in 2023 could be the first rung on a new wealth ladder. That is why today on Visual Economic, we will explain what these opportunities are that could benefit Japan. And above all, what the problems are that this country must overcome in order to take advantage of them. Are you ready? Of course you are. So let's get cracking. As we said just a few moments ago, what caused Japan's fall was essentially its financial crisis and competition from other countries such as South Korea, China, and Taiwan. Now, at the end of the day, every country has its problems. What has really stagnated Japan, though, has been its inability to adapt and to overcome these problems. The question is, why hasn't Japan been able to evolve and overcome its setbacks even after 30 years? Here, we can point to at least four fundamental factors, four structural problems that plague the Japanese economy. But let's go through them in order.
The first major root problem in Japan is the lack of labor. Unemployment in Japan is one of the lowest in the world, only 2%. And although this might seem positive, it's actually not so great. Companies have enormous problems finding workers and getting ahead. For years, Japan has had far more job offers than workers willing to accept them. And why is Japan lacking so many workers? Mainly for three reasons. The first is that Japan has the oldest population in the world. There are very few young people available to work. Over 75s make up over 15% of Japan's population for the first time. The second reason for the lack of Japanese labor is that their culture is very, very traditional. Women either do not work or work part-time to stay at home and perform household chores. And this cultural factor also leads us to the third reason. Japan is a country allergic to immigration. Its immigration laws are practically prohibitive. It is really complicated to go and live in Japan legally. As a result, it is difficult for companies to hire immigrant workers. This is something that is not only bad because it does not allow the nation to grow, but by not having immigrants from other countries, companies also lose the freshness, new ideas, and commercial and cultural ties that can originate in these other countries. The second problem that prevents Japan from overcoming its problems is that companies have a lot of trouble growing. This does not mean that there are not enough startups and entrepreneurs. It means that their startups are not capable of growing into large multinationals. The only very large Japanese companies are old, old ones. The new ones simply do not make it. And why does this happen? For a couple of different reasons. On the one hand, something that small businesses need in order to grow is investors to put their money in. So what's the problem then? Well, the problem is that Japan does not have a well-developed market for venture capital capitalists capable of putting up the necessary money. Most of today's startups tend to be non-profitable projects in their early stages, which need a lot of risky investment to grow, and once they have grown, to become profitable. Well, what happens in Japan is that investors, perhaps due to cultural factors, do not tend to put their money into projects that are very risky, but prefer to invest in safer and more consolidated projects. And that's not the full extent of the problem. The thing is, because companies know that if they do not make profits in a short space of time, they will not be able to attract investors, what they do is they grow less in exchange for earlier profit. And yes, that does allow them to make money, but at the cost of losing a lot of long-term potential. Meanwhile, another factor that could cause Japanese countries to be dwarfed is that they trade relatively little abroad. At the end of the day, many people live in Japan and companies can focus only on selling in Japan without the need to export to other countries. Nevertheless, this does create a long-term problem. For example, not trading abroad does not allow growth in larger foreign markets that could bring in a lot of money. At the same time, it hinders the dissemination of knowledge from foreign companies to local companies. And as if that were not enough, it gives Japanese companies less incentive to improve than they would have if they were competing in international markets. So what's the outcome of all this then? Companies grow less, are less able to innovate, and they find it more difficult to overcome economic problems, and therefore their productivity stagnates. Which, by the way, brings us to the third problem on our list of problems. Labor productivity in Japan is not just banned, it is catastrophic. To give you an idea, it takes about two hours of work by a Japanese worker to equal the one hour output of an American worker. Or, to put it another way, during his or her workday, one American produces almost as much as two Japanese. Contributing to this appalling productivity, there are many factors, yet we can point to one factor that is possibly the most detrimental of all, the culture of work. Let me explain. In Western countries, work is usually measured on the basis of results. If a worker does well, he or she keeps their job or even sees a salary increase, in theory. Meanwhile, in Japan, work workers are evaluated basically by the number of hours worked. Japanese people spend all day at the office, and not only that, but often when they finish work, they are almost obliged to go to endless company dinners. If you are a man in Japan, work is your life. You are going to be cooped up within the four walls until you retire. So, what's the problem with this, apart from the obvious one? Firstly, this causes significant social unrest, which may explain why Japan has one of the highest suicide rates in the world. Secondly, it also has very detrimental effects on productivity. As companies value work time and not results, workers spend hours doing nothing or doing things of little use. Yes, they spend a lot of time in the office, but they achieve relatively little during their time in there. On top of all this, however, another problem with Japan's work culture lies in the promotion system.
In Western countries, getting promoted in your job depends on your ability and productivity. If you are good, your company will offer you a promotion, and if it doesn't, you can look for a better position in a competitor's company. The point is that in Japan, promotions do not depend on the ability of each worker, but mainly on the person's seniority in the company. As a general rule, new workers start at the bottom, serving coffee, and as time goes by, they slowly start to move up. And visual economic viewers, this is a serious problem. Firstly, because young and clever people cannot reach positions of responsibility for a long time. This makes companies rusty, they don't have the best professionals at the helm, and they find it difficult to adapt to new technologies. Secondly, this form of promotion makes it impossible for an employee to move from one company to another. No matter how much of a super programmer you are with a position of great responsibility in a company, if you move to another company, your seniority and the benefits associated with it disappear, and you will start from square one. Obviously, all of this means that the most qualified people often do not reach the jobs where they could have the most impact. This would be a bit like if we put Messi to work cleaning the locker room instead of putting him on the field to score goals, which is complete nonsense. I'm told. Yep, given all these factors, let's move on to Japan's last major structural problem. This one. The vast majority of the problems of Japan that we discussed before could be solved if foreign companies and investors decided to undertake projects in the country. They could implement new work cultures, develop larger companies, and try to attract skilled foreign workers. However, as you can see in this graph, Japan has never been characterized by strong foreign direct investment. In fact, quite the contrary. Yet it seems that in recent years, this investment has started to increase. And visual economic viewers, this is no coincidence. As we told you at the beginning of this video, Japan could be about to enter a new phase that could leave behind or at least reduce all the problems we have talked about. In fact, the lack of foreign investment could be the first of them. On this channel, we have told you many times about the big problems that exist between China and the US. In fact, we made a video explaining just how these problems were causing many companies to leave China in droves. Well, the interesting thing about this is that Japan could benefit enormously from the business exodus from the Asian giant. Many of the companies that are looking for the alternatives to China could move to Japan, which is a much better and safer place and has much better relationship with the West. It turns out that this is already happening. IBM, Google give $150 million for US-Japan quantum computing push as China looms. Meanwhile, another big problem that we have told you about previously on this channel is the fragile supply of microchips to the West, the famous semiconductors. The vast majority of these chips are currently produced in two very specific locations, Taiwan and South Korea. The thing is, Taiwan is a country in grave danger of being overrun by China, and that would be absolute chaos for the microchip industry from which the West benefits. To avoid that, one solution for microchip companies could be to set up factories in other countries that are not at risk of being invaded by China. Any guesses what one of those countries might be? Exactly, it's Japan. TSMC to invest $7.4 billion in second Japan chip factory. As you can see, the land of the rising sun is becoming an excellent business destination to protect against threats from China. But this is not all. Over the past few years, the government of Japan has been making great efforts to improve the country's intellectual property and R&D investment. On the one hand, this is good news for the country's technological development. But on the other hand, it may be a factor that will further boost the arrival of foreign companies, particularly technology companies that need a good intellectual property ecosystem. In the same vein, another important factor that could trigger foreign investment and exports, which, as we have seen, are so necessary for Japanese companies, is the depreciated yen. Japan's currency has been getting cheaper and cheaper for years, in large part because the Japanese central bank has been intentionally reducing its value on numerous occasions. As a result, foreign companies that invest will find it much cheaper to hire local personnel or to buy supplies. In turn, it will also be cheaper for buyers from other countries to purchase Japanese products. However, there is one problem with all of this. A cheaper currency currency also makes it more difficult for Japanese companies to purchase foreign supplies. With a depreciated currency, you need to spend more to buy the same thing. And this is especially important in the energy market. Japan has hardly any fuels of its own, so it needs to buy everything from abroad. And what happens if the Japanese currency is weak? Well, basically, fuel becomes very expensive and can hurt businesses. Then, it would also be the issue of the risk posed by investing with a steadily declining currency, but that too is something that could change very soon. We'll talk about that in the future. So don't forget to subscribe to all of us here at Visual Economic if you haven't done so already. Given all of this, fortunately, the government could solve this problem in two different ways. In terms of energy, Japan is a country with a lot of room for growth in renewable resources such as wind, solar, and geothermal energy. On the other hand, Japan seems to have taken the lead in other types of imports and is one of the main promoters of free trade agreements around the world. 
Japan and EU seal FTA after four years of talks. Thanks to all that we have explained, Japan could receive a lot of foreign investment over the next few years. This could help the country to renew itself in aspects such as its rusty business culture, improve its mummified productivity, and even establish international ties that could help those small local companies that today are finding it so difficult to grow. In fact, the government seems determined that the international route is the key to getting the country growing again. We will assist more than 10,000 companies in developing their businesses in the international market. We will provide manufacturing and business restructuring assistance that will help them achieve their goals. Transcript adapted from the Japanese Prime Minister's office. International expansion and investment would undoubtedly be a breath of fresh air. And by the way, there is one last factor to be added. Take a look at this. Japan begins experiment of opening to immigration. In recent years, and thanks to some reforms to former Prime Minister Shinzo Abe's immigration system, Japan seems to be moving towards a progressive, albeit still slow, opening up to the arrival of immigrants. As you can see, the arrival of foreign workers has increased steadily over the last few years. In fact, the total number of workers doubled between 2013 and 2018, and it is expected that in the future, these figures may increase even more, something that will undoubtedly be crucial to improving the development of the Japanese economy. In any case, and in view of the challenges and new opportunities in Japan, it's now over to you. Do you think that the problems in China will be able to boost the Japanese economy again? Or is this just a mirage? Will international investment be able to solve the dire problems of Japan's labor culture? What do you think will happen with the immigration issue in Japan? You can leave me your answers in the comments below. And if you found this video interesting, don't forget to like and subscribe to all of us here at Visual Economic. All the best. I hope you enjoyed the video and I'll see you next time.